I spent four years at the School of Oriental and African Studies, London University, doing my first degree. And never once, never once in all those years did I learn anything about any African civilization. <laughs> Anthropology has for a long time had a love affair with the primitive and the great interest, the almost exclusive interest, has been on that little man living on the edge of the world. And I know about that little man because I am a primitive. I spent nearly 14 years in the jungle, and not the jungles of Africa, the jungles of South America. I was born in Georgetown, but I spent a great part of my boyhood in the jungle. I lived, therefore, on the periphery of the South American civilization. I was three quarters African and about a quarter Makusi Indian. I could not, for a moment, think that to do an ethnography of the Makusi Indian, a little primitive tribe on the edge of the world, I would be giving any vision whatsoever of South American civilization. I little knew then that behind me lay Makapiku, a city carved out of sheer rock, calling for the engineering ingenuity unparalleled in Europe at the time. I little knew that my, the Makusi had cousins with the Mexicans, and I'm not talking about shrunk Mexico of the day, I'm talking about Mexico when it was the center and core of Native American civilization. And Columbus himself never saw that Mexico. Columbus wandered on the edge of the periphery of America. Columbus, in fact, never once, never once set his foot on the American continent. Even within recent history, the recent recorded history of the world, of the Americas, of Africa, we, have, we are faced with massive delusions. And the object of this conference here, the mission of the scholars who have come to this conference, is to put an end, at least the beginning of an end, to this madness. <laughs> we know very little, or rather we have known very little, of the technologies of early Africa because of this concentration on the primitive. I grew up in a jungle twice as large as any jungle in Africa. Africa, in fact, has less jungle than any other continent comparable with its land space. If you take two Europes and put it in Africa, there is more wooded woodland and forest in two Europes than there is in Africa. Our image of jungle springs from the fact that most anthropologists, at least in the past, it may be changing slightly now, and with these studies, it will change even more rapidly. Most anthropologists have been satisfied to go looking for vanishing little tribes, utterly irrelevant, the Booga Booga and the Luga Booga. <laughs> and they go and they spend six months a year and they study all they know about the Luga Booga. All their little ritual and their dances and their kinship system, who is my mother's brother, sister's son, etc. Utterly irrelevant any illuminating vision of African civilization. And they come and they extrapolate masses of things about it. And so we have thousands and thousands of books about Africa that tell us absolutely nothing about the quintessential Africa. <laughs> this has been the case for at least five centuries. It is only within the last five years that we have had discoveries that make us aware of what is happening in Africa. Only within the last few years, five to 15 years, only a few men have come forward and have given us this vision. Because even many of our so-called African scholars are so Europeanized that they merely repeat and echo what they have discovered. And I'm not using the word Europeanized in a racial sense. I too, like Sheikh Antibiotic, can claim 
perhaps with even more justification, that I have not a racist streak in my being. I am saying this because it is true. And I'm saying it because I believe in what I call the Eurocentric and Afrocentric visions. It has nothing to do with color or skin. It's a state of mind. It's a state of consciousness. It is just a tragedy and a truth that most people who have Eurocentric consciousness happen to be white. But this is also true of a great many of our blacks. And I speak having traveled throughout the black world. A great many of our people have no conception whatsoever of where they come from, what is going on, and where they're going. And I have heard many of my people say, we have to start from scratch. Let us admit we did nothing. Even in the tongue-in-cheek poetry of Césaire, though Césaire is a great poet and he never meant it in that sense, we who explored nothing, we who invented nothing, this is far, far from the truth. Just a few years ago in 1978, two American scientists, Smith, Schmidt and Avery, discovered that Africans were smelting steel 1,500 to 2,000 years ago in Tanzania. They were smelting it in a machine that was using a semiconductor technology unknown until the 20th century. They were making steel at 1,850 degrees centigrade. No machine, no iron smelting machine in Europe or anywhere else had achieved those temperatures. The highest recorded in Europe was about 1,620 degrees centigrade in a second century furnace, Roman draft furnace. And not only that, not only they found Africans were producing a fine bloom of carbon steel, they were doing it in a single stage so that even in the middle of the 19th century, when George Wilhelm Siemens, the German, found a method for mass producing steel, the European process in the mid 19th century involved two stages, whereas the African process involved just one. They were do using iron crystallization process in order to produce that steel. And they were doing it not only more efficiently, not only were they producing a finer bloom of steel, but they were doing it using less fuel. The Africans were forced very early into fuel saving technology. These things have only recently come to light. And they have changed our understanding of what really happened in the ancient world. And right in that area where you see these little shattered villages, that is where an industrial site had grown up 1,500 years ago. We were often told about how we were dragged out of the bush and how colonization lifted us up. Few of us are aware. We are aware of what happened to the transplanted black, but very few of us are aware what happened to Africa itself. You cannot imagine what a Holocaust hit Africa. You cannot imagine what it is to take about 100 million people, the youngest people, and rip them out of the heart and core of a continent, the disintegration of family networks, the tremendous things that fell on Africa, the disease in one area in Tanzania, there were five million head of cattle, Europeans came in, introduced rinder pests, not deliberately, but they introduced it nevertheless. Almost all the cattle disappeared. You cannot imagine in the Americas, millions of people vanished just because of the common coal which Europeans had introduced in America. You're not aware of the massive destruction of civilization so that people could mock us now and say, are you talking about all the great things that you did? If you did all of these great things, why are you not great now? What has happened to you? Why are you so broken and shattered and fragmented and lost? Why do you feel so inferior? We feel inferior and fragmented because we have lost a sense of the wholeness of our history. And make no mistake about it, while it may be very difficult or perhaps impossible to change in any revolutionary way our economic situation for a long time to come, we can change our consciousness, and through consciousness, we can literally change the world. In 
that is why these are not just facts. We do not just come, as academics usually do, to give a new set of facts, because facts are not necessarily true. Facts need to be breathed into. You have to be, facts have to have a quality of vision. Because as I discovered when I began to study Native America, the prehistory of America closely, I found the people who had the most facts had the least truth. <laughs> it has to do with a certain vision, a certain eye. Why did the American scientists have to discover the steel-making machine? Why didn't the British discover it? They were there much longer. No. They assumed that the Africans had only achieved 1,250 degrees centigrade in their blast furnaces. How did they arrive at that scientific conclusion? Because that was roughly the lowest temperature at which you could smelt iron, and the low Africans were the lowest people. And there was no question that they did smelt iron, so that was their centigrade. There was no proper scientific study of their machines. Nobody went and asked them. I know that. When I was in East Africa, I was sent out by the School of Oriental and African Studies, London University right here. I was sent to get a list of legal terms. They didn't expect me to produce a dictionary. They like this piecemeal nonsense. You go out and you do your little thing. Somebody goes out and studies hesitation phenomena. I met a girl doing a PhD in hesitation phenomena. I said, what is that? She says, you know when you're going to say something and you pause, you say, eh or er? <laughs> what do the Swahili say? That's our PhD. <laughs> Concentration on irrelevancies. Concentration on pettiness. That is why there emerges from that the image of petty African. <laughs> and I asked when I was out there, I saw them making up an enormous word list. They had been spent three years making up an enormous word list of legal terms. And I said, and I'm not going to call names because some of these people are still living, unfortunately. <laughs> but I asked them, why are you doing this? Why don't you go among the people, find out what Swahili legal terms they're using in the courts? And I remember someone turning on me. I can't remember the accent well because I've left Britain 14 years ago. Then set him up. What are you talking about? Going among the people? What? writing do they have? They only started to write when we came here. <laughs> I went the first day I was down in Morogoro. I found documents, long legal documents, going back before the British times, almost into the German times. And it was on the basis of those documents that I was able to build slowly the dictionary of Swahili legal terms. When I came back, they said it was, a, it was a landmark in Swahili studies. It was an important contribution. Yet when the time came for my degree, they said it would not be counted. <laughs> Never heard about it again until I saw parts of it creeping up in the works of uh, the published work of one of my esteemed colleagues in the United States. <laughs> I want you to know, and I suppose you already know this, and that is why one speaks of this in advance, that knowledge about black people has become highly political. There is no way, and I have tried, I have tried to avoid getting involved in these problems, but there is no way that you can present these facts without presenting the atmosphere in which one garnered these facts. When I brought out my book, they came before Columbus, I was pilloried, the New York Times spent three pages, they'd never attacked a black man like that, three pages trying to show it as nonsense, oh, packed with lies and vituperation. And then they waited when 70 professors defended me, people I don't know from Adam, including people, the oldest Mesoamerican archaeologist who had actually discovered the African heads in pre-Columbian America. And they spent seven weeks to print those letters, and the letter I wrote back to my critic, it was heavily doctored. All the facts, just statements, every time I tried to substantiate what I was saying, they deleted it. They put dot, dot, dot. 
this is not a joke. This has become a very serious matter. I was denied permanent residence in the United States for nine years. People just walk in like that and get permanent residence for four years, three or four years. I could not travel outside of, my, of America without being on parole. They had a little thing, my picture. I'm on parole. I had to go to Trinidad on parole, on the country arrest. Why do these things happen? Surely knowledge of this nature is recognized as being very revolutionary, very serious. But let me come back to my subject. The discovery just a few months after the steel making machine by Lynch and Robin, they discovered an astronomical observatory, a kind of African stone edge at Namoratunga, Northwest Kenya. Namoratunga, the place of stones. They discovered that the Africans there in Kenya had developed an astronomical observatory. It looked at first like just a scrabble of stones, but when the stones were properly studied, they were in precise alignment the constellation of stars, and they were able to show that these Africans had built an accurate prehistoric calendar 300 years before Christ in Kenya, which is at least 100 years before the father, so-called father of modern astronomy. And this was not their first calendar. I don't want to touch in Egypt now because Sheikh Antony Yaffa said enough about that. But let me point to the fact that the calendar we use today is derived from the Egyptian. They were the first people to invent the second of time, the second of hour, the hour, the minute. Their astronomical observ observations over many years produced these ideas, these precise quantities and volumes and times and standards which were later to dominate the world. The Babylonians did not have any proper calendar. The Egyptians had the 365 and a quarter days and the 365. And they took that quarter and they stretched it out over a long period of time. They dealt with that quarter. And they put five festival days at the end of the year, festival of the gods, and they split the year equally into 12 months of 30 days each. When the Greeks took it over, then they spread it out. As a result, today we have 28 day months, 29 day months, 30 day months, 31 day months. We need a rhyme in order to remember which is which. <laughs> That calendar was invented in Ethiopia since 4,241 BC. And before I leave Egypt, as I say, I don't want to dwell too much in that, but other parts of Africa. But before I leave that, let me mention the discovery, the significant discovery, which Sheikh Antony appointed to today, of Ta Seti. The discovery of a monarchy in the Nile Valley preceding the Egyptian at least two centuries before the first Egyptian dynasty. And at Tarseti, they found not only architectural forms to which Dr. Diop pointed to this morning, they found the falcon god Horus, they found the crown, the unmistakable, the, the uniquely shaped crown of the Egyptians, they found the palace facades that were later used by the Egyptians, and above all, they found the hieroglyphs so that the world's first major writing system is not even Egyptian, it is Ethiopian, it is Sudanic. <laughs> there are so many evidences apart from the question of what the Greeks said who actually saw these Egyptians, apart from all the evidence that Sheikh Anthony Op has brought forward and others. There is evidence the migration, the movement of agriculture. Every major plant in Egypt, at least half a dozen are from coming from the south. There's not a single plant that comes down to the south. This nonsense about civilization, that civilization in Egypt was created by Asiatics and Caucasoids, and then they brought the light of civilization down to the benighted black barbarians in the south. Not a single spread of evidence. The script comes up. The agriculture comes up. All the symbols comes up. The, the conceptions of God and all the various forms that were to become deities in Egypt, it all comes from the south. The art, everything, you can see its origin in the south, in that Ethiopian and Sudanic world. And Taseti is the culmination, it's the capping of the evidence. 
When we look at astronomy, as I was pointing to the calendars and the, and the thing found at Namaratunga, they found something even more startling among the West Africans. In the 13th century AD, about seven centuries ago, they found Africans were plotting an invisible star, Sirius B. Sirius A is a bright star we all see in the night sky. Sirius B is impossible to see with the naked eye. It is impossible to see it with the naked eye. It has a magnitude of about 8.5. And the Africans not only saw it, they plotted its orbit and trajectory right up to the end of the 20th century, up to the year 1990. And the diagram produced by our best astronomy today is identical with what they produced centuries ago. We only became aware of that star towards the end of the 19th century. <laughs> and not only that, they intuited its mass. This is a white dwarf. It is an imploded star. It's not only impossible to see with the naked eye, it is, only, it is the most sophisticated astronomy that has shown us that a star so imploded is much heavier than stars that appear six times brighter and larger. They came to that conclusion. They had plotted the spiral structure of the Milky Way. They had seen the Jupiter and Saturn, the rings and the moons thereof. They had worked all of that out, but particularly Sirius B. It caused such astonishment, such consternation in astronomical circles that Kenneth Bretcher, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he said, the Africans have no business knowing any of this. <laughs> and that is true. The Africans, as we know them, as we have been learned to conceive of them, have no bloody business knowing anything. So that we have to, he has to check himself as to who he's talking about, because when we talk about the so-called traditional African, we are not talking about what lay at the core and heart of those shattered civilizations. If you want a modern example of what I mean, why all these discoveries are coming, but let me for a moment dwell on some new discoveries. Do you know that the Africans actually showed something contracting and expanding within the region of Sirius B? Oh, uh, um, a supernova. Do you know only two years ago the Einstein orbiting satellite, one of the United States satellites, discovered the supernova? Two years ago. Space machine. <laughs> Last year, one of our space machines, American space machines, sent down radar beams into Africa, 16 feet below the African Earth, and saw traces of ancient rivers re running from the Sahara towards the Nile Valley. I said that in my book seven years ago. <laughs> special about that because a few anthropologists had said that too on the basis of migration evidence and other kinds of evidence, linguistic networks, etc. But now they can see it from outer space above the prejudice. <laughs> they found, for example, mathematical systems in Africa. The first use of numbers, the first Scientific evidence of the use of numbers is found in the Congo Zaire. It's known as Ishango bone. It's 8,000 years old. It's very simple, but it's, it is cited because it's the first evidence we do have. But we have found more complex, far more complex mathematical systems, like the Yoruba, for example, are found to be using a complex mathematical system, which one of the mathematicians, Conan, calls one of the most abstract and complex mathematical systems. Why didn't we know about this? Because if you go among the Bushmen and the Kalahari, or the Wugabuga and the Lugabuga, you're not going to find mathematics. <laughs> I mean, you don't go on the edge of the world to search for technologies. I've lived in Europe. I've not only lived in Western Europe. I spent nearly a year in Eastern Europe. I've lived among primitives, both sophisticated Europeans of the cities and semi-primitive Europeans. I've been in parts of Europe in a village where as many as 20 people were using one bathroom. This is the 20th century. Nobody writes about those primitives because it's not fair. That's not the European. That is a European. 
And this is constantly being done to us. This is taken for granted if you want to deal with the African, you find a savage, that is good enough. And when we, we can do that in Europe, and when we try to dwell on civilization, because that's what we are largely involved in, at least I am, Sheikh Antidi of, to some extent, Carlos Moore and others are involved in this, the classical civilization, the major classical contributions. When we dwell on this, people say, but you're being romantic. When they're dealing with the primitive, they're not romantic. But when we try to bring it down to the core and center, we're romantic. Look at mathematics in Europe. It was nothing. Do you know that when the number system, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, that's Hindu, the Arabs and Africans invaded Europe as Moors, and the Arabs brought from India the numbers Fibonacci, yes, brought it to Europe first in 1202, but the Europeans didn't accept it because the church said numbers are works of the devil. <laughs> as late as the 17th century. So you have basic arithmetic, that, that's the most, it became a capital offense during the Inquisition to study advanced mathematics and Arabic documents. Do you know how many documents have been destroyed in the world? The Library of Alexandria where the Africans had built a library, some people calculated it a million, let me be conservative, half a million. And these are not the libraries you can duplicate. You could blow up any library here. You could duplicate it somewhere else in the world. There are very few manuscripts that are standing by themselves. This was a time when a manuscript represented centuries of learning, where there were few duplicates or no duplicates at all. All destroyed. And yet the fragments exist. So significant that we have 10 major medical texts in African languages, the first medical texts in the world are in African language. The first mathematical papyri which you saw this morning, that's African. Those are the first. Even today, with all the destruction, we could still go back to the African documents and show them on a screen. The Ebers Papyrus, the Edwin Smith Papyrus, the Smith Papyrus, which is 1500 BC. They have chapters on helminthiasis, ophthalmology, gynecology, pregnancy diagnosis, circulation of the blood, the pulse, diagnostic percussion, all that, chapters, intestinal disease and all that, all that 1,500 years before Christ. Africans. When we go to look at these things, the people say, well, why did it all disappear? How come it all this? But look at the present world today. Suppose there was a third world war, which God forbid, but suppose there was. Most of the technology of the world is concentrated at certain centers within a matter of minutes. And believe me, it is a matter of minutes. It's not no days and weeks. The preliminary battles may take a few days and weeks, movement of armies and a lot of bluffing. But when the bomb strikes, it's just a matter of minutes. And the people who the people who don't see the light when it strikes are the lucky people. Most of the major cities of this civilization will be not even smoking. Mm -hmm. It will be almost nothing. The bombs dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki are baby bombs. They have bombs now 1,000 times more powerful. It does not smash the teeth. It turns them into vapor. Even the clouds burn. Even the waters of the ocean are thrown up into the sky. You can imagine what the whole people might survive. People might survive, but they will survive on the periphery, the edge of the world. That is the people we're going to look to centuries down the road and says that was their level, that was the level of science in the 20th century. That's what they're doing to Africa. Because what they struck us with was equivalent to 100 hydrogen bombs, particularly where they struck us most, the consciousness of the African people. I have seen people breaths scraped in such a way that you wonder if there's a brain left at all. Everything is an echo and echo and echo. They haven't even begun to question the basics in this civilization. As Dr. Diop has shown, 
that a great deal of the Greek science, and we're not attacking the Greeks because they had their own genius too, but the basis, all these things they claimed, you see, Hippocrates, taking sections, sections out of the work of earlier Egyptian writers without giving any credit to them at all. Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem was worked out long ago. Pythagoras spent seven years, some people say 22 in Egypt, and he comes back with all this, even medical theories, and brings it all back to Greece and all the claim. All the great European scholars went to Africa. Thales of Miletus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudoxia. There's a whole list, a whole list of them walking into Africa, picking up things from astronomy, geometry, medicine, etc., and going back home and claiming it to be theirs. Father of this and father of that, when they're the children. <laughs> In the field of scripts, and this is one of the things, we are the non-literate peoples, we are the, I've often heard this, we are the simple peoples, the simple societies, we are the oral peoples. The English are oral, where is their script? This is not English script, this is Roman script. There were only a few Europeans who wrote, only a few Europeans had script, and they gave it to the others. When Cicero conquered Britain, or when the Romans conquered Britain, I remembered Cicero saying, the English are so stupid, I am not even sure I could make them into good slaves. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not casting aspersion on the English, I'm just telling you what Cicero said. <laughs> but all this thing about oral, there are many scripts in Africa. The first script, the first major script that was to affect and influence a great part of the world was African. That script of Tasseti, which goes up and becomes more advanced and developed in Egypt as the Africans move up. The Meroitic script, which we have not yet broken. We have 800 texts in Meroitic. We haven't yet broken it, broken the code. We have Manding script. We have a whole series. I was in the jungles of Suriname and found them using, the, the men were writing in the Afaka script to their girlfriends. They came with it from Africa, the Faka script. They were writing the Faka script, the Akan script. They developed apart from, they had, they had drum scripts. Nyangoran Boa has shown us the complicated drum scripts they developed. So that there are written scripts in Africa. So yes, only a few people use them. That was true of Europe too. Very few Europeans were literate. Even many medieval European kings did not write. They had this color cast as you had in Africa, in America, and in Asia. A few people wrote it. It's only within recent times that you have the great mass of people educated. But it always seems, because we stand at the end, broken and defeated, that we were the last to come on the ladder. No, sir. It's just the opposite. When you go and look at their medicine, I spoke to, in Atlanta to the Center for Disease Control. Africans had aspirin before us. They were using salix capensis, which is salicylic acid, the main active ingredient in aspirin. They were using tetracycline 14 centuries ago in Nubia. They found the yellow-green flash of tetracycline in Nubian bones 14 centuries ago. They only started using that antibiotic in America in the 1950s. They pioneered in several operations. They pioneered in the caesarean operation. Dr. Finch has written a fine thing on the caesarean. At the time when it, that operation was experimental in Europe, people like Dr. Felkin went into Africa and observed the Banyoro surgeons performing the caesarean, and the mother was hale and hearty after four or five days. No woman survived the caesarean in Europe in the 1870s, none. No woman survived and they observed the operation, the way they stitched, the way they opened the belly, the way, the way, the kind of instruments they used, they observed they were using one of the instruments, the cautery iron, which took fantastic skill. It was very minor tissue damage, it caused great ruptures in the European hospitals. They found that Africans were using both anesthetics and antiseptics in their operating theaters at that time, when in Europe, 
listed only introduced antiseptics two years earlier than the witness of this operation, which the witness said must have been going on for quite a while because the Africans were performing with routine skill what was then experimental surgery in Europe. In the 13th century, they were performing eye cataract surgery in Jenne. But when we learn about African medicine, they go to the quacks because it's exotic and primitive and nice. So you go and you picture the quack. That's why the camera lies. You take the camera out, the camera is not supposed to lie. You concentrate on the edge of a world. You pick out the quack and you, you listen to everything. He says all his little magic and his nonsense. He says, well, that's African medicine. You don't deal with the scientific superstructure of that medicine. If I wanted to do that American medicine, boy, are they quacks out there. I am terrified of getting sick because I'm sure my sickness would be fatal. <laughs> I have never been diagnosed correctly. As soon as I get, I go to the diagnosis so that I could guess the worst possible scenario so I could fight against it. <laughs> so when you look at medical science, you see, for example, one of the innovations that Africans were the first to use drugs to deal with hypertension and certain forms of psychotic disorder. Even one of their medicines, Reserpine, comes out of the African medicine chest. They have a vast herbal pharmacology. We are only now beginning to study this and see the scientific knowledge the Africans had of plants. And when we talk about plants, they were the first in the agricultural field recently, there's been a big discovery which has been disputed where they found that Wadi Kubania and Wadi Tushka in Egypt and Nubia, the earliest cultivation of cereal, wheat, and barley, etc., and this was dated about 18,000 years ago, about 7,000 years before any other civilization. It is now being downdated. They said they made a mistake. But when they thought they were right, and that they had made a mistake, they started to excuse it. They said, it is probably not true that agriculture is the basis of civilization. This is the, the, could you understand what these five centuries have done to the consciousness of the world? That even when things are found, even when they're there, you cannot understand. Do you know how they explain the Dogon finding Sirius B? The Russians have given the best explanations because the Russians contacted me when I brought out my thing in the New York Times. I got a letter from Sanarov, academician Sanarov, from one of the Soviet science cities in Asia, saying that the Russians had been working on Bering Strait migrations and other migrations from the Pacific area. They'd never heard of Atlantic migrations before. They were very interested in my research. And in the communication, I asked them about what they had been doing in Egypt, what discoveries had been made on the NASA because um, Sadat had kicked them out. And they pointed out that Volosimo, one of their scientists, had found perfectly ground spherical crystal lenses in ancient Africa, and that the Africans had telescopes. But they didn't even bother to think that Africans had telescopes. They said that perhaps, and this is Carl Sagan on big television in America, that some scientifically literate European wandered among the Dogon and gave the African savages this knowledge. And that Later on, when anthropologists came to study it, study them, they merely vomited it up. The anthropologists who studied the Dogon, Marcel Griot and Germain Dytelin, Griot spent 16 years among the Dogon before they started to talk about that part of the heavens. A long time to vomit. <laughs> and no one at that time before or after, until very recent times, knew what the Dogon had found that there was an elliptical orbit of 50 years around Sirius A and an orbit of one year on its own axis. We only found the flashing and darkening of the supernova two years ago. We have not yet found, and we may not discover this until next year when we send up our latest space telescope. We will not be able to verify what the African said about the one year orbit on its own axis. Yet the European gave it to him in the 1920s or 30s. Let me shift from the African world now and touch on something in closing that I have had intimate acquaintance with. I have been one of the few blacks who was sent by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration
to witness the launching of the first black American into space, Bluford. That was done in recognition of the work I had done at NASA on blacks in space science. One of the things I discovered is that not only African science is little known, but even modern science, the contribution of blacks to modern science is little known. Look at this electric light. It is true that Edison pioneered in the electric light. But Edison could only keep the light burning for about 16 hours. The man who provided the carbon filament that made light universal and practical was a black American, Louis Latimer. He literally lit London and New York. He actually supervised the lighting. He wrote the first book on incandescent electric lighting. We don't know nothing about him. A man who was to transform the economies of Britain and France in the sugar industry, the man who invented the sugar machine, which was to, which on the principle, the principle which we use today in, in taking those sugar crystals taking the cane juice and transform them into sugar crystals is a black West Indian, Jan Matsalega. <laughs> the first man to mass produce shoes in the world. They used to take a long time to produce a shoe by hand. The first shoe making machine, mass production of shoes. It was called the niggerhead machine after its inventor, a black West Indian. Well, African. I'm just putting him back in the <laughs> of African ancestry. The first man to transform the food industry, the food transport industry in America, and to refrigerate the trucks because they were using the primitive method of ice blocks with food. He transformed the food industry. There again, Frederick Jones, an American, black American. You go and you look at a whole field of things. By the year 1913, 1,000 inventions by blacks were patented. And that was in spite of the fact that in the 19th century, around 1856 or 1848, there was a ruling from the Attorney General, who ironically was called Jeremiah Black. <laughs> he ruled that you could not patent, a slave could not patent an invention because a patent was a contract between the government and a citizen, and black slaves were not citizens. So in spite of the fact that their early inventions had to be patented under the names of their white masters, or later under the names of lawyers, yet by 1913, as many as 1,000 inventions were patented by blacks. So I went into, the, into NASA to find out what was going on in the space industry. They came to me and they gave me a whole lot of biographies. I said, I'm not interested in biographies. I don't want to hear who married who and where they were educated. It's a waste of time. The biggest fools I have met in the world are the best educated. most grateful for is that in spite of the fact I've been heavily miseducated for many years, I broke from it because at the root I was not a normal person. I grew up in the bush. I was not part of this civilization. From the time I came out and I looked in the city, I didn't like city people. I, I, I can adjust to them now. <laughs> but there's that inherent distrust because I found that people who had learned things from books, written in a certain way for centuries without much change, just echoing the lies of the past, knew very little about what was and what wasn't. I therefore depended on my instinct, which I tried to kill for many years, but it kept haunting me until it broke through the shell. That was responsible for my survival. The constant doubt that springs from the fact that it is impossible to totally suppress the soul of man. I found, for example, while I was at NASA, that the leading black at NASA was the man who had coordinated all the work of the scientists to produce the world's first space shuttle. The man who was responsible, who was the director of the driving flight 
research center who coordinated all the work of the, of the scientists to push up that first space shuttle was a black man. His name, hold on a minute, is Major Gillam the Fourth. Major Gillam the Fourth. The leading technical astronaut whom I had a chance to sit and talk with the day before the launch at Cape Kennedy, Colonel Gregory, Frederick Gregory, he's the leading technical astronaut. He's one of the three men who were sent up to check out the space shuttle before it goes up. He was the man who was selected to redesign the cockpit, the brain of the space shuttle. He redesigned five of the cockpits because the first one was screwed up. He was responsible. He was responsible. I have a picture of him sitting blind in the middle of an airplane, blind, landing it on the point of a pin. He's responsible for introducing one of the most important new safety devices in airplanes, which will become common in the 1990s, the micro-instrumentation landing system, whereby whether the pilot is blind, dead, or drunk, that plane is going to land at the point of a pin. <laughs> He was responsible also for inventing a new power controller, which will enable the pilot to cut hand fatigue in half, enable the pilot to control all the systems in the airplane with one hand. And you find also the toilets, even the space toilets are designed by, designed by a black. And this was the best design they had because there's a problem in space when you have a call of nature, it doesn't go down, it goes up. <laughs> And they, they're always experimenting. So a few shuttles ago, they tried some balloon thing and it burst on the way down. It was a very nasty landing. And he, the same man, Sherney, Bob Sherney, invented the tires for the moon buggy. They had to find tires that would be 10 times lighter than Earth tires, yet would be able to have traction on one-fifth the gravity of the Earth, which is on the moon, and yet carry the weight of the machines, etc., the instrumentation. Sherney defies that. Sherney is also only man who has spent the longest time in states of weightlessness without going in a spaceship and the only aircraft we have, the KC-13909, KC-13509 aircraft, the only aircraft that flying a parabolic curve achieves weightlessness. And it achieves weightlessness for about one minute. It's known as the vomit comet because when it spins, everything you have inside of you, unless you're trained, comes out. And the leading researchers in hypersonic research, for example, the leading researchers is a black woman. She's the one who solved the sonic boom, Dr. Christine Darling has solved the sonic boom problem, which will enable us to fly several times the speed of song that the whisper in the 1990s. I met her also at Cape Kennedy. The leading, the two leading black researchers and the leading researchers in space medicine are two black women, one an Afro-Hispanic, um, Dr. Cowens and one Dr. Long who've invented a device which enables you to exercise your involuntary system that you can change your heart rate like the yogi. It's like a quantification of yoga. You can change your heart rate and your blood pressure. These things will be spin-offs which will affect the general populace later. These things are necessary in space because we find tremendous problems emerging in space. You go up in space and you find lots of the fluids in your lower system collect because you can't, it's not like um, one of those great spaceships you see in the space movies. You can't go running about jogging in the morning, but you have to exercise. You have to keep in extreme fitness because you're operating in zero gravity. And they have done tremendous work in space medicine, which will make a tremendous amount of difference to this. One of the things that I found extremely heartening, and let me end now, was that NASA was appreciative of what we were doing. They ordered 1,000 copies of this book, Blacks in Science, so that their astronauts and others could study it. So that they could see what contribution Africans were making both in ancient and modern times. The first copies were given to our two leading astronauts, Colonel Gregory, and Bluford, and these men 
are aware, even though they do not participate in this, they are aware of how important the work they are doing, how they become standards in the world. And that is what I want to end on. We are not doing this simply as an academic exercise. This is not just an accumulation of new facts. These things are presented because we can only heal, and this is true for the black as well as for the white, both the prisoner and the imprisoned. Both the, the prisoner, sorry, and the jailer. We are doing this because it is necessary to revise the history of man. The tremendous anguish which is deep in the heart of all of us, which arises out of these falsehoods, the falsehoods upon which this civilization are built, have got to go. This is a movement, this is a movement which is sacred. There was a time when certain people were able to take their history and turn it into a sacred document. History, the study of history in times such as this can become a sacred activity, a religious activity, whereby the fragmentation that we have suffered, the sense of loss, the sense of alienation and homelessness can be redeemed by a sense of wholeness, a new sense of wholeness. Such a sense of wholeness can only spring from what we bring here, a new vision of history. Thank you very much.